Welcome back after the lunch break. I hope you all had a good lunch. We're here on the Winter Garden stage at FOSS Backstage Conference. And we're now going to hear a talk about open source contributions in today's world uh, from Lina Böcker and Angelika Wittek. Yes, hello everybody, nice to see you here. Uh, directly after lunch, it's not the easiest slot we all know, and we have the exciting topic about open source governance, so get excited. Um, we talk today about open source contributions in today's world, so different aspects, um, difficulties, and especially we concentrate about uh, the binding between legal and uh, open source development. Um, just let us introduce uh, Lina, you want to start? Yeah, you could also start. Uh, hi, I'm Lina. Um, I'm a lawyer and a specialist lawyer for IT law, and I've been working in open source compliance since 25 years. <laughs> yes, I am that old. <laughs> um, and I work with clients on their open source compliance licensing issues and stuff like that. And sometimes I work together with Angelica if I have technical questions because I'm not a developer, even though I know a lot about software development, it's sometimes very useful to have someone who can actually tell you how to do that on a technical level, um, what I want my clients to do. Over to you. Thank you. So I'm Angelika Wittek. I'm an ind independent open source consultant. Um, I have over 20 years the uh, experience in open source uh, and software development, architecture and design. Um, in the last years, I, I'm um, supporting industry collaborations in setting up and uh, maintaining open source projects. And uh, yeah, it's very valuable for me, vice versa, uh, to have some, somebody like Lina, who we get in the more detailed um, things about open source governance. Okay, let's step in. Let's step in, exactly. Um, while we are speaking, please feel free to chime in at any time and ask your questions. We do not want this to be frontal lesson for you to listen, but we want to keep you awake after, after lunch, um, so please ask at any time. So we directly step in. So this is uh, uh, some kind of a schematic uh, about uh, contribut contributions and distributions. Um, in German, we call it Wimmelbild. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, uh, with the help of this uh, slide, we will guide you through the talk and uh, discuss different aspects of contributing uh, uh, different roles and uh, different in infrastructure. I believe always when Angelica shows me that slide, I think that's probably what my clients think when I start talking. No, like, oh my God, <laughs> it's so much. It's yeah, not that uh, much. We try to to have little bites for you so that you can you can digest it easily. But uh, yeah, this is so. This just is just one word. I, um, so you you see these uh, green turkeys um, um, boxes. And what we especially want to talk about is if, if, if you start implementing and then starting building things and contributing that the part you, that is self-created from you is getting smaller and smaller and uh, up to end the, on an, uh, uh, the deployment on a node. And this, uh, this is all about uh, we are distributing more and more third-party content. How many software developers are there among you? Okay, that's the majority. What does the rest do? And why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> In the legal talk after lunch. <laughs> cool, super. And, okay. 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 Okay, so everyone's involved in the community and, and knows what we're talking about. It's just always good to know, to have a rough idea about what people do in the room because, so you can, you can um, adapt to where to pick them up. Um, we start with maybe six minutes of the very boring legal part. Uh, nevertheless, it's the basic for the talk and it's the basic um, for your work, for your daily work, uh, whether you work in management, consultancy, or uh, are actually a developer. Um, and that's also why I'm here. <laughs> um, so the first question you should ask yourself uh, when you hear that buzzword, license compliance, is wh what is it all about? Why do I have to think about that? What, what is it? What is this compliance thing in the world? 
whether you come from a governmental um, authority or whether you are just an open source contributor to a project, it's something to think about. All software, whether you write it or, or whether you use it, is protected under intellectual property laws. Intellectual property laws are laws like copyright, patent law, and stuff like that. Um, that sounds good. Um, and it means for you as a developer that whenever you write code, um, the code belongs to you. Or if you work as an employee, belongs to your boss, your company, the company you're working for. Um, but at the moment when you start writing code under German copyright law, it's yours. And um, you have all rights in that. We talk in uh, like five minutes about what happens when you're an employee, but for the, from the start, it's yours. Um, that means there are two things under German and European copyright law that you cannot waive. One thing is the personality right, the morality right in the code. Yes, there is some. Um, and the other one is the right to, um, to avoid and to hinder um, someone verunstalten, um, uh, th th that someone um, like makes your code ugly. When you look at that um, and try to wrap your mind around moral rights and computer programs, um, you may find yourself asking yourself, what role does that play when I code? Um, that's because the software copyright law comes from actual copyright law as in art, as in pictures, as in literature, as in very creative works. There was a long discussion about where to put software and where to put code uh, when, when uh, the discussion started about protection of computer programs. And for some reasons I could talk about endlessly, but that are pretty boring, it ended up in the Copyright Act. Um, and that's why you have more rights in your computer program. That means for each of you, when you're the author of a program, you can prohibit others from using it. And so can any other coder, any other author of software. And that also means whenever I use software that was not written by me, myself, I have to get a license. I need to obtain the right to use it. I can either get that by statutory law, there's a very narrow amount of rights that you actually get from the law itself, or you need a contract. And that contract is called license. Do you regularly check your code for licenses when you use it? Cool, <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Usually the, the answer here is, uh, what? <laughs> Where do I do that? How do I do that? So it's always important that when you use code that you have not written by yourself, check it for the license that's in there and check it for copyrights. And once you have done that, check what you have to do in order to obtain the license. And when you find out the conditions under which you get the license and you comply with them, that's called license compliance. Why do I have to think about it? The first reason is always, as I just said, the code belongs to you as a programmer. And when you, as a programmer of code, decide on a certain license, um, you exp explain to others how you want your code to be used, what conditions you want to be complied with when others use your code. So the first aspect is always respect the wishes of the person who wrote the code. He said, you, you may use it, you may use it in a number of ways, but you have to do this and that. If you don't do that under certain licenses, this is a copyright infringement. And copyright infringements are not as harmless as that may sound to someone who has not uh, a legal background, um, but they are punished under criminal law, which means, yes, you can go to court if you do it to a big, big extent, though. Um, and if you run a business, if you're a company owner, you have a legal duty to make sure that in your company no rights are infringed, no rights are violated. So and if in your company copyrights are violated, you're liable personally. So always think of that when you, when you use code that you have not written yourself. Um, as you, with your background, probably know, um, there are basically three types of open source licenses. Um, the word copyleft should be familiar to all of you in the room. There are strict copyleft licenses and there are weaker 
copyleft licenses, even though I personally don't like the, the term weak because it's more a restricted copyleft than a weak copyleft. Um, and then there are permissive um, licenses. There are, there is like a fourth category coming up at the moment, which is not open source, but often appears in the context of open source, and that's the so-called, cool, screen sharing is so cool, um, <laughs> uh, the so-called source available licenses, um, which means they have certain restrictions that are not compatible with the open source definition, such as you may not use it commercially, you may not use it if you have an annual revenue of X, Y, Z, something, some, some things like that. Um, you all know the Elasticsearch license, probably, because open source has a, uh, open search has a boot upstairs. Um, yeah, and not all of these licenses, because they have different conditions, fit together. Um, some of them have contradicting um, uh, conditions, and that means you cannot use them in the same project. Um, some people think that whenever you use permissive green licenses like MIT or BSD, there's nothing to do, and that's wrong. There's also the MIT and the BSD and all the green licenses do have certain conditions, such as don't touch the copyright remarks, forward the license text to whoever receives the code, and stuff like that. The only license type without a condition is public domain, something that not exists in uh, German copyright law. In German copyright law, you have to interpret public domain as um, giving all rights to the user, but not like putting the code out there and not wanting to see it again. Um, that means as a bottom line, whenever you write code, whenever you use code, whenever you contribute to other open source projects, take care of license compliance. The most, almost all of the open source licenses start their obligations, start the conditions you have to comply with, with distribution. There are a few meanings to distribution, and it's different under US copyright law than it is under European copyright law, but um, the bottom line of it is whenever the code leaves your house, leaves your company, leaves your computer, um, you have to obtain, you have to, have to comply with the license conditions. Over to Angelica with the more fun part. Okay, so uh, Lina just explained that we have to be careful, that we have to care about co our code, so self-created code and content, and that we also have to care about other people's code we use in our implementations. So um, if we look at the red box here, um, so normally we are starting with an idea um, and start to implement it, so we create IP. Um, then. We have to think about, if we want to open sources, we, we have to think about the license Lina just uh, told about. And, uh, or if we are contributing to an existing project, we have to um, um, uh, uh, follow the, the license uh, obligations uh, the project is under. So um, what we have to do is, um, what Lina said, um, putting our self-created content code under uh, the uh, copyright and, the, and putting the license headers uh, on the top of every file. And we also have to care about license comp compliance. So um, we can only uh, recommend to uh, use tools like Ort or scan, scan Code or others and automate it. Because as developer, I want, don't want to care every day about checking manually something I, I'm using somewhere in my code. And um, with the third party libraries, so the libraries I'm using, uh, please be aware that you don't just have to check the direct dependencies, but you have to check the whole um, transitive closure. So each dependency from a dependency, you have to check. And you have to also be aware if you are changing, um, for example, a minor version, this is as a new li uh, library. So you have to make the checks for every version you're using. Okay. So um, as an example, uh, it's from an Eclipse project here. So how, how do we do it in concrete uh, at the Eclipse Foundation? So um, we have special files on the root level of our repositories. So um, the most important is the notice file. Here I put in all information I have about my project, where is the source, where the documentation, how get I, st get I started, 
um, the license and um, maybe um, attributions. Then you have a, a file that, that's called uh, dependencies, but you can see this as an SBOM. So this is the list of all libraries, not only list, but list plus attribution of all libraries you're using. So your third party content. And um, you have the license as it. So here, for example, GitHub is showing this. It's an Apache 2 license. And you can also have an author's file. So Lena just told something about uh, copyright. So um, for example, if uh, from some law you write copyright your company, uh, then you can put your name, your personal name in the author's file. Um, there are some other files uh, you, you, you're putting in. This is not about legal. This is about being a good open source project. So for example, a readme file for explaining people what it is and how to do it, uh, a code of conduct, so being awesome to each other, um, changelog if you're releasing. Um, and a security file becomes more and more important, of course. So here you describe uh, how to deal if somebody is finding a vulnerability in your code, because maybe you don't want to open a bug that is public visible in the first moment. Has any one of you ever scanned your code with, with an appropriate tool? One, two, three, oh, at least some. Cool. What, cool. what tools did you use? Mm -hmm. Everyone scan code? Word? No black ducks? <laughs> one black duck. <laughs> Uh, that's something, if you work in, in bigger projects, um, we usually recommend to do that every once in a while, so once a month maybe, depending on the size and the, and the update frequency of the project, so you have an overview. And always scan on a file level. It's not enough to have the declared licenses in your SBOM. You need also the hidden ones in, in some files because sometimes they contain copyleft provisions or other provisions you have to comply with. Um, that's, that's maybe one step before uh, Angelica's excellent uh, documentation of how it has to look in the end is you have to find out what you write in there. Um, one question, so we talked before about the dependencies. In the dependencies, are you listing the dependencies that are part of the source repository? Microphone, otherwise you see the machine on the disk. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So um, talking about the dependencies file um, that is listed or given here, um, are you listing there the dependencies that are part of the source repository or all the dependencies that are being pulled in the moment I build the source? So um, it's, it's all dependencies you rely on when building and, and also when testing in this case in the source code repository. That's what you, what you list in the repository. When you distribute software, it's all dependencies that you compile and distribute. It's sometimes really difficult to clean that up as a lawyer, even with a bunch of developers helping you. It's, it's not that easy if you're in a dependency hell. Not so nice. And as uh, we just had it in the, uh, at lunch break, um, if we talk about third party content, yes, it's libraries, but be aware that if it can be also documentation from others and it can, and be ex extremely careful when using logos from others. So be and even names of software, right? You, if you, when, once you, when, you, when you change the code, and, and unless the change is very minimal, you're not allowed to use the original name anymore under trademark law. Okay, so uh, let's get a step further. So we have our code in, in our repository. We have our dependencies. We checked everything. We have our legal documentation in our repository. But now this is not the end. Yeah? Now it starts. We are building our software and we are putting our, the artifacts somewhere, for example, in, uh, in, um, in package managers like Maven or NPM. Um, so if we're building the binaries, we have also deliver legal documentation together with the artifacts. Um, this is really important because this is what comes to the, uh, to the user. So if, you, for example, you have a jar file, with a, so a Java application and a jar file, you put the documentation in the metainf folder, for example. If you are developing front ends, I think everybody who uses software knows about this about thing. So you have to list everything or make the references to the, to the files, maybe you have the, the repositories, you have to give the user 
all information what you're using and also about your own code, how it is licensed or copyrighted. So, yeah, I think I, I told... I think we've said all that already. This yeah, just I mean, a... the, the, I think the first point uh, I just uh, want to point out, uh, when we talk about how to do it, I mean, um, it's clear that sometimes you're forgetting something, yeah? Your script broke and you didn't recognize or something. So important thing is have processes in place and describe how, it, you know, how to directly implement in your project. So because then if you missed one point, it's not, from a legal point of view, it's, it's not... It can avoid liability. If, yeah. you, if you can prove that you have all the processes in place and that you're not acting grossly negligent when, when missing out on a copyright notice, um, you're not liable. You just have to, you, you get a cease and desist letter, for example, you have to comply with that and cannot do it again, but you're not liable on, in a financial way if you have that in place. And as a company, it's also important to avoid direct liability of the management. If you have documented processes, um, you've, you've done your share in compliance. Okay. Um. Okay, uh, going further, uh, we have our code, we have our artifacts, but now we want to uh, offer Docker images, not only Docker files, but also Docker images to, to our users. So um, just as a reminder, Docker files are the recipes how to build an image, and the images are the binaries. And if it's running, you call it container, just to get it. As a question from online. <laughs> so one question uh, from the audience. How would get buy in to pay greater attention um, to licenses and copyrights in less formal environments like hackathons or game jams? That tends to be a little more lenient. Um, when participants are typing to get projects up and running without shorter time frames. Um, if you want to read it again. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it, it's a standard question, um, and it's a question Angelica and I have been asking ourselves various times. Um, spread awareness. Talk to your colleagues about it come to talks like ours, there's more lawyers, open source lawyers in Germany than, than me, it's not only one, um, and discuss internally what you can do and what you have to do in order to, to get things more compliant. Um, one word, um, uh, back to the, to the uh, Docker thing, um, the thing is when you, when you distribute Docker images, you always distribute the whole image and all layers of it. That means when, when it comes to compliance, you have to check all layers and you have to scan all layers. Um, regardless of um, the, the file is, yes, you have to. I know can. Ah, you can, you can. <laughs> Scancode.io helps you. I know <laughs> We can discuss this later, but I can prove that you can. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically the, the, the main point when it comes to Dockers and, and, and legal compliance. Make sure that you know what's in your container and that you can comply with all the licenses in there. Um, and you, as you are all familiar with the, with the issue, you probably know that, but um, the license of a Docker file and the licenses in the image can be completely different. Yeah, uh, one um, from, from a practical point of view, so what, what we are doing, so um, the first thing is always uh, really ask yourself if you, if you want to publish Docker images, if it's really necessary, not only from a compliance thing, also from uh, security uh, topics, because you ha also have to maintain it, and please think a little bit about sustainability. I saw too many projects who are uh, publishing each, each snapshot and never touching again, so uh, the people cannot rely on that, either from non, not from compliance and also not from security uh, perspective. Um, what we are doing, uh, or what we, we can recommend is, for example, uh, Docker Hub official images, but there are also other images out um, that are curated and um, have active scans running on them. And if you put your application on a base image from, uh, for example, from a, on top on, of an uh, official Docker Hub 
image without um, modifying the base image, then you can reference to all the legal to the to the curated information Docker provides. So this is one way. The other way is scan everything, but it's not only about scanning. You have also to curate it, and this is the tricky point. Everyone says that. <laughs> If you cannot scan it, you cannot use it. That's the bottom line, legally. You can scan it, but the results are useless. Okay. Not always, not always. We can, we can discuss this outside. We only have five minutes left, so I would, I would rather go to the, <laughs> through the last slides. Um, but I'll be here till tonight, so happy to discuss. I think um, we can keep this short. This is the cloud part. Um, when, you, when you publish something in the cloud, that's also distribution. Um, and, and making available source of source code. And even if you make it available only as a software as a service, um, some licenses do add conditions on that. So the AGPL is the most famous one and a few of the, of the source available ones. Um, one note, because it's the topic of these days uh, on, on AI as well and, and uh, using AI to code. Who of you uses Copilot or something like that? How do you make sure that the outcome is compliant? <laughs> <laughs> the magic word today is scan. <laughs> um, even though GitHub claims to use only legal code or licensed code for the training, um, there is some proof in the world that that's not true. Um, so whenever you want to distribute output that was generated by any coding AI, um, make sure that you know what's in there and use a good snippet scanner before you distribute it. If you only use it internally, it's not a problem. But if you, if you want to distribute it and put it in your products, make sure you, you are allowed to do it. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because I just looked these days uh, at GitLab. Uh, they have in the, um, the how it's called? the developer certificate of origin, um, they have some guidelines for AI-generated code. So I can highly recommend to look in it if you have questions about how to license uh, AI-generated code. At the Eclipse Foundation at the moment, uh, it's, it's not allowed to, uh, to contribute AI-generated code because uh, it's in conflict with the ECA, so the Eclipse contributor license, but they are working on it. Um, Are you done? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just important that you, you always, whatever method of coding you use um, and whatever method of distributing you use, um, that you make sure that you know what you're doing and if you're allowed to do it. Um, and this is the bonus slide. We have two minutes left. I'm just saying there are, there's a huge package of um, EU regulation coming up that's relevant for developers like you. It's not only the AI Act, but also the Product Liability Directive and the Cyber Resilience Act, to name the most important ones. Um, the main point is that software in itself becomes a product now, once the, the Product Liability Directive is in place. Not source code, mere source code is not a product. Um, but software that runs is a product, and that means that all the product liability stuff and also the CE mark um, will, ha will play a role in software development at some point this year. No idea when. <laughs> okay, um, open for questions. Does this also apply to um, artwork, which is included in the software, like icons or logos also? What do, you mean? do you mean just the last slide, the, the cyber resilience and the product liability, or the no, compliance part? The, the whole compliance part. It applies to hardware in a different way, um, because licenses usually only apply to the software and the hardware, but uh, logos no, I, I and stuff I didn't stuff mean like hardware, I, didn't, I meant artwork. I, oh, yes, yes. yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, it, it, hard, as artworks are usually copyrighted, mm -hmm. it applies in a similar way to, to artwork, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Computer programs are treated in a similar way than artwork mm -hmm. by the law in Germany okay. and in Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. One more small question. That's the last one. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's a small one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give you an easy one. To continue on his one. 
Common question, what if you see artwork and the license is a software license? Does it then still work? What if you see code that's licensed under a CC license? Yes. Same question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it doesn't um, di directly, but you have to interpret and find out what the author wanted. So if someone puts an MIT on a picture, um, I can guess that he probably wanted me to use the picture wherever and to modify it and stuff like that. If I see software in a CC license, which happens quite often, I interpret the CC license. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. One more, we're... maybe? One more? One okay, more. one small one. That one? Oh, oh which, <coughs> which one? He, he was first. Okay, I sorry. Think. <laughs> sorry, but uh, we, are, we are here. <laughs> sorry, it's not an urgent one. Just like, what are the main types of licenses and compatibilities that you run into every day? Like the top three. The top three, the top one is MIT. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, clearly MIT. Apache is quite quite famous, so to say, and also GPL and LGPL. Um, the most difficult one that's in almost every software project that I analyze is SSPL, which is not even an open source license, but it, it's in Elasticsearch and MongoDB. That's why it's, it happens quite often. Um, and you sometimes, in a, in a Linux uh, uh, surrounding, you have incompatibilities between the GPL versions. All right, now that's really that's it. it. That's Sorry. It. <laughs> but as we said, we are here and open for, for any question. Exactly. Thanks, Lina and Angelica, for the talk.